Welcome back, folks. Already 11.30 here on CKMS 102.7 Radio Waterloo. Worldwide at radiowaterloo.ca forward slash listen. And, of course, we are doing a live feed on Facebook um, either at Vote For Me 6718 or right on the CKMS 1027 Facebook page. So for the next 30 minutes, we have uh, two members of the Green Party, uh, David and Bob. I will let you introduce yourselves in your writings and the Arizona. First, I'll begin. I'm David Weaver with Kitchener South Hespler. I've done 30 years of policing, just uh, hung, hung up the cuffs, so to speak, at the end of April. And uh, I've seen a lot in that 30 years, which has led me to where I'm at here now, wanting to make a difference in a different way. So, I'm Bob Jonkman. I'm the Green Party candidate for Kitchener Conestoga, uh, computer consultant by uh, profession but uh, passionate about things like electoral reform, public health, uh, peace and nonviolence. In fact, it was electoral reform that first got me into uh, being politically active. Uh, 2007 Ontario referendum is where I first started uh, protesting, holding up signs, um, and essentially becoming uh, active in that field. So I ran for the federal election in 2015, as, as you did, David, yes. um, where I recognized in the Kitchener-Conestoga area and Kitchener and Waterloo in general, um, a huge gap in in poverty and um, and social social care social uh, mm -hmm. facilities and so I thought I'd be concentrating most of my time working in the anti poverty groups uh, for which there are several in the in the Kitchener Waterloo area yeah, yeah. but ended up that I ended up doing more work on on uh, peace and on violence instead so that's sort of my introduction into the uh, political life. Well, being involved in law and security and justice, I've always had a strong sense of fairness that led me into that. And uh, to learn about our electoral system, and isn't that not where I first met you, Bob? Do you know fair vote? I think so, yeah. Uh, met you at a uh, Transitions KW meeting at uh, the Queen Street Commons. Yes. Where Realizing how flawed our voting system is it was depressing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I knew it was bad. I know people have disincentives to vote because they believe their vote doesn't yeah. count. But uh, until you actually study it, you don't really realize yeah. it. Have, do you find that you've talked to people where if you say, you know, your vote should count and every yeah. vote counts, they actually do kind of believe that based on voter support, that's what we get? Yes, a, a lot of people that's what they don't think. really understand that the voting system, you're, you're voting for a local candidate. You only get uh, one vote for one local candidate. And in our case, in kitchener Conestoga, we've got six candidates running, mm. which means that if everybody were to split their vote equally amongst the six candidates, that'd be about, about what, 18, 19 percent uh, per candidate. It means that if one candidate wins with one more vote than the rest, um, all the other candidates, some 80% of uh, the voters would not get the representation that they voted for because you only get the it one candidate. Nowhere. Yeah, And even worse, because you're getting a single candidate in each riding, that doesn't necessarily win with the majority of votes, only the plurality, more votes than everybody else. Mm -hmm. It means that um, a party can get a majority of seats with a minority of votes. And we've seen that in, in federal elections mm -hmm. and provincial elections over and over again, where with about 39% of the votes or less, a party gets a majority of the seats. And because they've got a majority of the seats, if all the other parties ganged up together and voted against legislation that the party in power wants to pass, because the party in power has a majority of seats, they've essentially got 100% of the power. Mm -hmm. People don't realize that, yeah. that, that their vote really is fairly ineffective. So proportional representation would fix that, which is yeah. a main part of the Green Party's platform. Yeah. Not so much an election issue this time. The, the thing that killed me was when I first realized that you could uh, win by that, you know, one, two, five, seven votes, whatever. And if that party won in, say, just 51% of the ridings, they would have a majority government. Mm -hmm. But in those other 49 ridings, the other 49%, sorry, the 49% of the ridings, they could have next to no support. And maybe the guys that come in second in the first... 51 right and 51% mm -hmm. right they might have overwhelming support in the other but because they only win 49% of the seats or less they have no say that's right and overall we could have more voters choose the loser so to speak yes. those are called the wrong way winners, winners yes. yeah it's it's absolutely ridiculous that we do this uh, so anyways thank you actually for being an advocate for that yeah. and I, I learned a lot from you and it made me being an advocate <laughs> for it uh, in the green party of course Right. Absolutely. So not so much an election issue this time, but it, it pervades all the other policies that exist. Um, for example, if you do want good health care or, or good social programs, 
Mm -hmm. um, it's all up to the governing party to enable that legislation. We've seen yeah. some some poor decisions on the governing parties, uh, both yeah. this um, this current government and previous governments, where had other parties had meaningful input into the programs, mm -hmm. um, say say for example the the basic income uh, pilot that's uh, that's taking place right now. Mm -hmm. Had the other parties had meaningful input into that, I think we would have seen a better program that existed. Oh, for sure. The, the pilot project, it includes uh, people that are in specific categories uh, that don't include individuals such as stay-at-home moms, people that want to be able to go back and get, yeah. and get further educated. It's really only uh, dealing with the people on ODSP and, and OW, yeah. correct? Essentially, yeah. that was the criteria for the pilot project, people yeah. who are on OW or ODSP. I both of which have seen how it would affect people that weren't on yes. either of those, and yet to have that guaranteed livable uh, yeah. income to keep them out well, of poverty, what freedom would that allow them then to improve their lives in other ways? All manner of ways. But you just said guaranteed livable income, and that's not what the pilot project is actually doing. So no, in, in the first place, it's not a universal basic income mm -hmm. because there's um, qualification criteria that you've already got to be just so poor. But the amount of income that people receive isn't a livable income. It's mm -hmm. an income supplement, perhaps, or um, you know, it's certainly better than nothing. Yeah. But it, it's not how guaranteed income is is intended to work, where you're providing so you a living wage. Results are not going to be all as helpful as they should be. Then? Well, they're certainly they're already showing now that people are are far less stressed. They're um, improving their own lives. They're able to um, stay out of the workforce in order to improve their education. Stay mm -hmm. out of the workforce to look for a job that actually matches the skills that they've been trained for, instead of finding the first emergency job. Mm -hmm. And for young mothers, they're staying out of the workforce longer to be with their children, and that's mm -hmm. got to be a good thing. So that's already happening. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that the pilot is going to really show the true effects of what a real guaranteed income, a, a guaranteed livable income, uh, would be able to achieve. No, I, I agree. It's it's a it's a step in the right direction, but we actually need much bigger steps. Yeah, exactly. And then there's other um, programs that governments have put in place. Pharmacare, for example. Mm -hmm. Pharmacare is is uh, has been you know uh, OHIP Plus is now allowing uh, people under 25 to get their medicines at no cost, no cost to them. Um, but as soon as you turn 25, that disappears. People don't get instantly healthy yes. uh, at, at 25. So that's a huge burden on people of low income, especially. Yeah. We're doing a lot of this age barrier stuff where we have mental health available somewhat for younger people. Mind you, we have 12,000 young people that are waiting for mental health services and yeah. not getting it. And if they don't get it, I'm really afraid what's going to become of these people as adults. Uh, they're going to be suffering and our, and our society won't be as strong because of the fact we haven't helped them right. uh, in the needs that they have when they're younger. But uh, once you become 18, you know, you're pretty much on your own for a lot yeah. of the health services dealing with mental health that uh, even though it's in yeah. inadequate, we're trying a little bit. With what, the what I learned at the development services um, panel discussion that I participated in a few weeks back is that the different programs are very siloed. Uh, they, they apply to a specific segment of the population, age-related generally, and mm -hmm. once they hit that age of 18, become adults, they're no longer in that program, but they're not in the adult program yet either. So mm -hmm. there's, there's this huge gap between being a minor and being an adult where there's no care facilities available to these people at all. Mm -hmm. And that's something that needs to be addressed. Yeah, going speak back to the universal uh, basic income, that doesn't take into account the poverty of seniors. It, they're, they're not on OW or o, o, ODSP, yes. so a program such as that... You're, you're talking about the, the pilot project, yes, not, the, pilot not the, project. the Green Party's uh, no, vision not the Green of... Party. Yes. Green Party vision is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> like, <it's>, like, <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't see any problems with it, but yes. the pilot project is so narrow-minded and, and it's so little in scope, yeah. and it doesn't really address the broad population for those that aren't on, right. on ODSP or OW. So obviously we both agree that it needs to be widened yes but absolutely. it also is that age restriction so to speak because right. older people they don't fit into the ontario yeah. works we're not trying to get them back to work so to speak you're no. 70 75 years of age you need help to stay out of poverty perhaps now there are there are some income supplements for old age security a lot of federal programs that, that provide some level of income but it's not a livable income no and, and that's the big difference streamlined so that we are actually giving that universal basic income to everyone we wouldn't have to have such administration in yes. in dividing between people and seeing you know you qualify here now you oh, don't qualify right. you have to go over there 
it's it's one of the things that was identified at the development sector developmental services sector debate as well is that um, the amount of administration that's required is immense mm -hmm. the people that require that aren't necessarily able to do that for themselves so they're um, depending on sometimes aging parents to do this for them um, and there seems to be in my opinion little compassion between the different agencies you know the agencies the bureaucracy of the agencies don't necessarily understand the trauma that this is putting families and individuals through. So I do know some people that work in, in some of these agencies where they they actually understand and they care, but the uh, the way the rules and the structure is set up, they, it's beyond their control. Yes, and and that's really unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned that you, uh, mental health as well, and yes. my observation, it was pointed out to me actually, is that under the current um, OHIP plans, there is no health care above the neck. We don't get dental care, we don't get eye care, we don't get hearing care, and mm -hmm. mental health care is lacking in, mm -hmm. uh, in facilities. So, Did you know that we're the only OECD country in the world that has a health care system that doesn't include pharmacare? Yes, yes. Uh, it's it's sad. crazy. So no, we're Canada. We're happily, Canada. yeah, happily, there's, it's being talked about at the federal level, Mm -hmm. And it's being talked about at the provincial level, although not in as full a scope as I would like no, to see. No, absolutely not. Right. It needs to be a broad scope. It can't be just for certain people in certain age groups. All of our healths are important. Yes. It, it's not, you know, obviously we want to care for the elderly. Yeah. We want to care for the young. But, you know, I, I have a, a niece that has a diabetic daughter mm -hmm. that is now getting to the age where we're basically, as, as a society, having a government maybe in play that's going to say your needs aren't important anymore yes. like go, go take care of yourself yes and it, it's not just for um medical drug benefits i think pharmacare should also be extended to assistive devices um had the pleasure of, of sitting on a panel at uh, yes. revision for people who have um visual um assistive device needs and it was appalling to me that there is a restriction on the devices that they're allowed to claim under this program. Mm -hmm. uh, they can only make a claim every five years. Technology advances much faster than that. Cell phones, yes. for example, have the great ability to um, be a magnifier, to be a, a text-to-speech converter, to all manner of things. Mm -hmm. Yet that wasn't on the formulary that as an uh, allowed assistive device. So people mm -hmm. had to do without. And if any of this stuff ever breaks down, repairs aren't covered under that formulary at all. So you've got people with obsolete devices, um, only certain vendors that they're allowed to purchase from, which leads to price gouging and, and uh, unfair um, market practices. Mm -hmm. And then there's no repair facilities when, when stuff breaks down. So that all needs to change too. I tell you, you, yeah. could, you probably just brainstorm and talk all day long about how, you know, it's not just the medications, but the supplies you need to administer them, like with yeah. diabetes. And yeah. It's a comprehensive medical plan that we need. Yes. We actually have a lot of money. Uh, I don't think people realize how much money we have, just how much we misspend. And I hope you don't mind, Bob, but I, I, I want to throw this over here because it's something that I'm really passionate about. And I want to make sure we say it. Okay. Uh, the Liberal government here had, what did they increase our debt by $60 billion in subsidizing hydro? Some incredible number, yeah. It, it is huge. And the NDP are talking about wanting to subsidize our hydro. And uh, the Conservatives, they want to keep the rates low, but they don't say how. So obviously, if they're going to be keep on, uh, they're going to keep on having the same kind of power system. They're going to have to be subsidizing. Um, the Green Party is the only one that's saying we can get power at source for one third the cost by importing excess power from Hydro Quebec, okay. and we wouldn't do that forever. But we can get it at less than five cents a kilowatt hour there. So what's the current and price? Less than five cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, but, but but the current price for. Electricity is well, what fifteen and it, change. It, you know, it's it's not quite at fifteen, but it's going to triple. It's going to be going up because all three of the major parties have committed to stay in the nuclear uh, industry and rebuild Darlington at a cost of thirteen oh, million yes. dollars, and that's going to be coming up in a few years. Or they'll have to, if they want to stay in it, they have to rebuild. It's a thirty-year contract. They don't renew contracts for one or two years in nuclear. No. And and the OPG has already said they're going to need sixteen cents yeah. a kilowatt hour. Not just Darlington, um, but Pickering is due for recertification as well. Yeah, so yeah. it Pickering, yeah, their license expires in August. Right. So if we we're actually paying in Ontario to get rid of our excess hydro right now, we have excess. So if we let Pickering not be renewed, we can get rid of our excess power, so we're no longer losing money paying to get right. rid of power. 
And then to rebuild Darlington, it's going to triple the cost. So if we don't rebuild Darlington and we import that power from Quebec, it's a bridge. Research and development, as you know, is very, very fast paced. These yes. And to look at having cheaper renewable energy technology yes. being able to be accessed next year, the year after, the year after that, we can do that if we don't lock into a long term 30 year contract triple right. the price with nuclear. Now, people are going to complain that if you're shutting down these nuclear plants, you're going to be putting a whole bunch of people out of work. A lot of work created by the renewable industry. We got 274,000 jobs in Canada with an average pay of $92,000 yes. in the clean renewable energy yeah. sector. That is where the puck is going, as Mike Schreiner, yeah, our leader, yeah. always says, go where the puck's going, not where it's being. That's right. The uh, renewable energy sector, um, the Green Party of Ontario has a plan to make Ontario um, completely um, on renewable energy sources by 2050. We're the uh, only party that wants to go yes. totally carbon free yes. by 2050. Yes. The others, uh, some of them have some nice targets saying 80% below certain 1990 levels and stuff. Yes. All it's right. A, not enough, and B, the plans they have in place are not going yes. to accomplish it. Yeah, and so we've, we've got the skills, the, the talent, and the resources to, to make that all happen. The determination, yeah. too. Yeah, well, we, we could do, but there's there's a lot of big industry that's very reluctant to move. You know, big ships uh, turn slowly, so I think that it needs disruptive technology to come in place. Talk about turning slowly. I want to back up to mental health. Sure. And then after that, I'll have probably the two big issues of mine off the table. Okay. Um, dealing with energy is one of them, but mental health. You know, I, I mentioned that I've been a police officer for thirty years yes. until the end of April. In that 30 years, I've seen all three big parties have majority governments, one time or another. All of them yes. had majority governments. And during that time period, I've never seen anyone take seriously mental health, poverty elimination, and drug addiction, and yes. homelessness. Yes. Now, the Green Party is looking at affordable housing in a different way. They see it as a crisis when there's more people waiting for affordable housing than in it. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. a crisis. About 40,000 so, people on the wait list, something like that? It's ridiculous. Yeah. We need to have 20% of all new housing builds yes. be affordable housing this, and homelessness. Yeah, You said there was plenty of, of revenue available. This is one of those hidden sources of revenue. The developers mm -hmm. who want to develop existing lands or possibly develop new lands, although yes. I'm, I'm hoping that there's no not much more greenfield development we need our farm space. Mm -hmm. um, but they would be on the hook for providing 20% affordable housing in any development that they create. And that's one of the sources of revenue. The developer's revenue sources is mm -hmm. one of the places where it doesn't, it isn't going to affect the general tax barrier or the cost of uh, other homes in that development may go up a little bit. What do, you, what do you mean by on the hook? A lot of the programs that mm -hmm. governments or, uh, or parties are proposing require mm -hmm. tax increases. Um, there are some parties that are going to offer tax cuts and also offer additional programs, and I have no clue at all how they're going to uh, to pay for that. Uh, I've heard it called magic money, yeah. um, fairy but dust. but yeah, fairy dust. The, the Green Party has a cost of platform where all the um, programs that they're advocating for have a source of revenue that's available today. So mm -hmm. the affordable housing, the twenty percent affordable housing that needs to be paid for someplace, mm -hmm. has this hidden revenue source of developers. A developer may decide that you know they're not going to pay that cost for 20% affordable housing, housing, mm -hmm. but the land available for development isn't going to go away. There will be another developer that comes along and says, "Well, well they'll step I, up and do exactly, it. they'll step yeah. up and do and it." The nice thing about it too is that right now the government model has been that the, the the provincial government has downloaded to municipalities the responsibility of paying. 45% of the cost for affordable housing. So oh, they'll, yes. they'll only bring in so many units because the municipality only has so much money. Yes. But with the Green Party policy of just saying it's mandated right across the whole province, yes. all developers, it's a level playing field, they have to do 20%. Yes. They bring in the affordable housing. And then when these things are, are these homes are operated by a co-op, which, you know, I guess, Maybe the builder could get in on this on the front end if they sure. want to start to run it. But uh, uh, the, the individuals that live there would, in, in committee, run them. And they're quality-built homes, so yes. they don't need as much maintenance. Um, rather than Homes that. built at the same level of, of quality, if you will, as every other house every in the other development. Yeah. And then they can run them themselves. We don't have to have the government with their fingers in every pie running everything. And we don't have to finance it at 45%. The cooperative 
if mandated to be made, can eliminate the housing crisis and they can run it separate from the government on their own, have that pride knowing that it's their responsibility, yes. but it's also their their joy, yes. it's their home. Right here in Kitchener, all in Kitchener itself, we're seeing a lot of success in cooperative housing already. Red and Roses Co-op, for example, mm -hmm. one that I'm familiar with, um, is a really successful, thriving co-op. So the, the model for that works mm -hmm. and so it's totally separate from government. It is at the moment. But that is awesome. Government could provide um, assistance there mm -hmm. in the form of tax breaks um, or possibly a, uh, a standardized municipal housing strategy so that all municipalities have to follow the same strategy, the mm -hmm. same ideas behind providing this kind of housing. Mm -hmm. And what I said about the hidden revenue earlier, mm -hmm. people who are off the hook would be the municipalities who no longer have to fund the um, legislated affordable housing yeah, percentage. That's brilliant, because yeah. that's the only way it's going to get done. Yeah. It's a huge problem. The municipalities do not have the money for it. We have to think smart. And it's the same thing with our energy, right? Why do we want taxpayers to pay triple as much sourced energy mm -hmm. when they can get it for one third the price? Absolutely. And then we don't have a huge debt trying to subsidize the energy. That's right. Uh, why, is, why does the government always have to try to subsidize, subsidize, subsidize yeah. based on poor models and terrible decision making? If you actually have the right decisions up front, they're going to be fiscally sound and they're actually going to be yes. progressive. They're going to accomplish what we need. Yeah. Uh, affordable homes, we're going to take care of people's mental health so that we're not putting them in the hospital. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I got to share this with you. <laughs> <laughs> Policing. Policing. Uh, we, we pick up uh, uh, calls for service all the time. Yes. Half the time, call to call to call. Half of our calls are dealing with those issues that yes. we talked about. And we can take somebody under the Mental Health Act to the hospital, have them seen in triage, seen by an admission person, a nurse, a doctor, a psychiatrist, and then after five hours of guarding them, they're, they're kicked out of the hospital because they're not deemed to be a suicide threat yes. or harm to themselves. And that's but, but, but still suffering from, from still mental suffering. Uh, health issues. $7,000 at that visit. And we have people that we're taking up to the hospital yeah. a dozen, 15 times a month. Over a year, it's a million dollars in cost yes. because we're not helping them. And but there, there, there's a reason for, for that exorbitant cost. It's because those healthcare services aren't available to people who request them. So Before crisis. Before crisis, yes, right. exactly. So th there's not enough funding, there's not enough staff, there's, there's just not enough in the way of programs available to make this a preventative issue. Do it up front. You spend it a dollar up front, you're going to save way more than seven, yes. probably more than 70, yes. in my opinion, after the fact, because I have seen firsthand this, the people we deal with yeah. over and over and over and over again, and it breaks my heart to see that we're actually not helping yeah. them, and it doesn't help our community, and it's fiscally irresponsible. Today, with the way things are structured, it's sometimes the only way to get people into the healthcare system. And it's it's not really a healthcare system at that point, it's a sick care system. You're only looking after the people who are already sick, yes. rather than doing the preventative stuff and making it a healthcare system. Well, it's so overburdened that it becomes largely a revolving door and only the most desperate of cases are able to stay and get the help they need. Yeah. And that is really a sad thing. Yeah, it is. So. Back to um, hidden sources of revenue. Mm -hmm. Two things that I just want to cover quickly is, um, carbon tax, but first um, resources for um, resource extraction rather, resource mm -hmm. extraction royalties. Can you tell me about resource extraction royalties? I think you're more up on this than I am. Well, I don't know. I, I've heard Mike Schreiner, our leader, talk a lot. You know, I really wish we could be hearing him in the leaders debate here coming up on Sunday <laughs> because uh, he, is, he is the guy that yes. knows uh, better than most. He does this full time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know what? I do know that we charge less than 2% uh, royalty rate for aggregate extraction. Yes. And uh, I, I believe that it's either in Manitoba or Saskatchewan, they're up around 9, uh, 11%. Right. And, I and, and, and that's, that's the next lowest the next after lowest. Ontario. So Ontario yeah. is really... Well, we're a business. Yeah, yeah. And what I understand is we're basically, we're giving away our resources. And if we would just up it up, uh, up it to the next level, like the, the second yeah. least charging. 9% is problem. what I've heard. We, yeah, it's a billion dollars. Yeah. A, a billion dollars in revenue can go pretty far. Yeah. So resource extraction includes things like diamond mining. And, yeah. and I heard the horror story where um, a big international, Canadian based, but internationally mm -hmm. in, in scope, diamond mine in Northern Ontario provided royalty payments to the First Nations community where the diamonds mm -hmm. were of $75. 75 bucks, yes. And it's not really a royalty uh, so much as it's a one-time fee. Yes. This is not per year. This no. is not per ton of diamonds. Right. This is, here's 75 bucks now, go away. 
pretty much. Yeah. And you know, that just should not be. I wouldn't pay for the supper I had a few nights ago. <laughs> you know? yes. That's, that's uh, bad. Yeah. Hey, you know, in talking about uh, treating them so poorly in, in, in their lands and taking yes. resources, in all of our lands uh, that we share the, these resources when it comes to water, uh, you know, we know that yep. it used to be, what, it's $3.73 or something for a million liters. The Liberal government listened a little bit to Mike Schreiner and Water Watchers, yes. so they bumped it up to 500 bucks now, right? For which, a million liters. Which is still below the cost of any other liquid that's, you can get except maybe uh, print drink. You know, print drink might be more expensive, but that's about it. Bob, what would it charge you, or what would they charge you if you took a million liters of water? Out of oh, the good Lord. I, I remember that $1,500? $1,500. $1,500 for a million liters of water for the consumer. So what kind of a tax break is that for a corporate? Well, they're, they're taking not just a million liters, but they're taking millions and millions of liters. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's a, a huge untapped revenue source from uh, there. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily want to continue that as a source of revenue. I think no. that these large corporations, and I'm thinking here Nestle's in particular, um, should not be allowed to tap into municipal water supplies um, that municipal water supply is there for the municipality, for the Absolutely. citizens. It's, it should not be a corporate resource that they sell at tremendous profits with no benefit at all to the local citizens. No, and one thing I'd like people to be aware of is it is no better for you. That bottled water yes. is in a plastic bottle. Single-use plastic bottle. That probably gets blown around, yeah. ends up in a stream, goes into a river, ends up in the yes. ocean. It's, it's, it's terrible. Yeah. And the water is no healthier for you. It's just more expensive. It's basically the same water we get yes. in the taps. You know where our tap water comes from. It comes from the ground, the same place you're bottling. Oh, exactly. So, well, <laughs> and, and so this is part of the problem is that this huge industrial extraction of water is lowering the water table and making the aquifer unusable for municipal water supply. Yes. So, yeah. I'm shipping it all off. It's terrible. Okay, one more source of hidden revenue the carbon tax. Oh, the carbon fee and dividend that the oh, Greens carbon like. Fee, yes, money. yes. And the, you know why we call it a fee and not a tax, right? Why is it a fee? Because the government doesn't keep the money. That's right. You see, if, if we had it as a carbon tax, like all the other uh, parties are doing, the revenue would go into their coffers and they spend it as they yes. want. But with us, the money gets pooled from the polluters and it gets redistributed yes. in checks to yes. all the citizens. So as, it crosses, the as it crosses the border or as it gets extracted, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of fossil fuel extraction in Ontario at this point. But yeah, so as soon as it gets extracted or crosses the border into Ontario, um, the fee is applied yes. to, to that. But it doesn't go into the, into the general coffers, it gets returned to all citizens of Ontario yeah. as, um, as a dividend to them. So those but, but it's going to increase the cost of, of fossil fuels. It's going yes. to increase the cost of gasoline, of natural gas, of all those things. But now you have the people who make the most use of those fossil fuels paying that carbon fee, but it gets applied to all the citizens as mm -hmm. a dividend. So those people who are, in, who are good conservationists, who don't use much in the way of fossil fuels, will be able to see some revenue from the dividends. Um, and those people who use more fossil fuels, we'll, uh, we'll see the effect of uh, the carbon fee. I guess I, I've been knocking on a lot of doors, about 30 hours a week for quite a while now. Wow. And I came across a, a guy that he, he runs a business. He's got a big, you know, F Ford 150. He's mm -hmm. got all the equipment he carries in the back. He's got to use it for work. Yeah. You know, those things are not good on gas. No. And uh, we had to talk about this and I explained to him, if the price of gas goes up, and it will a bit, it's actually you know four cents, six cents, seven mm -hmm. cents. You know, most of the most of the the money being charged in fuel. Gas right now prices is go up profit. more on a long weekend. Yeah, it's so. mostly corporate profit. Yes. And but what what portion is the carbon tax under the current system? If if we were to have that as a, a fee and dividend, he would end up paying more at the pumps, but then he would need that vehicle for it. He would get a check that would basically make it wash even. More or less. Uh, so, so it's not going to hurt him. But his neighbor across the street, who's able to walk four or five blocks to work or ride a bicycle on the trails, mm -hmm. which, you know, we should support more of, right? That's yes. a whole other story. But you can then take that $1,000 or $1,500 that when you get that check, and you can buy groceries, you can do things, you can live better and healthier lives coming out ahead. So uh, that is the thing that I like about the Greens, yeah. the dividend. Uh, you know, you it gets returned to the the people that, absolutely uh, can most benefit lots of lots of good plans in, on the green party platform which if you're online you can see at gpo.ca slash platform that'll redirect you to 
all the information with a complete costing chart, by the way. Something or you can do slash vision and just get an overview of yes. all of the wonderful ideas the Greens have. Yes, uh, ideas that haven't necessarily made it as elections issues today, but things that the Green Party stands for. So David, where can we get a hold of you? Well, you can get a hold of me at the Green Party office. We have it at 6 Duke Street East in Kitchener, or you can reach out to me through the gpo.ca website. You can connect with me. My email address is on there. Uh, they can do the same for you too that way, Bob? Pretty much. Uh, I've got a website too, bobjonkman.ca, which has my uh, email address on it, uh, bob.jonkman at greenparty.ca, and the phone number for the office, and, and all of us, in fact, is 226-476-4529. You can get a hold of any of the Waterloo Green candidates that way. Well, you're the IT guy, so I'm glad you're on top of that. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Bob. For thank you, David. And thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. RadioWaterloo.ca on the web.